All right, you'll be okay. Oh, I'm out. No, I'm <laughs> All righty. Well, I will start sharing my screen then, and we will start this. It feels so formal, and I'll guess I'll start the screen so I can start a PowerPoint. And... Hello, everyone. This is Elizabeth. She's going to talk about cool things today. Uh, she's our guest and uh, super awesome, but I'll let her introduce herself. I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. And hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, my name's Elizabeth, as Lee said. I am a Paralympian. I'm retired. The pronouns I use are she, her, hers. Um, I'll, my next slide is really uh, all about me, but I'm really thrilled to be here. I love swimming. I have been a swimmer my entire life. I'm fortunate that where I live in North Vancouver, and so if I, I would like to do the um, indigenous recognition for the territory, that's the Stolo, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, um, Coast Salish nations and territories. That's where I am located right now presenting to all of you. And it's really important for me as someone who's passionate around inclusion and diversity to talk about and recognize the nations because um, first of all, I was on Team Canada, C-A-N-E-D-A for 13 years kind of weird to start to quantify life that way and um, I have the maple leaf tattooed on my back I'm super proud but never once in those 13 years of my career did we talk about our indigenous peoples and that even our country's name Canada comes from the Iroquois peoples and it was K-A-N-A-T-A -A -A. so that's important to me I'm also a mom and my daughter is going to grow up in a world where we actually really think about these things and are purposeful around our first peoples and our first nations. I didn't learn about residential schools until way too far late in my life. And my daughter's six and in kindergarten, they were starting to learn about it. But I figured since I'm doing, um, since I live and breathe inclusion and I'm doing a presentation on inclusion, it's really important for me to model some of what maybe we can do in our day to day, whether it's meetings that we have or openings to some of our big events. So I'm really proud to be talking about inclusion and recognizing those territories where I come from. And how do I preface all of this? Um, I've already said that I live and breathe inclusion. Um, for those of you who didn't see Cassidy speak last week, one of your very own coaches, um, I got to watch it on BCSSA's website or YouTube. And um, I really encourage you to take one hour and 17 minutes out of your lives to watch that. Um, she's one of your own. I'm an imposter or an intruder. I'm a pool rat, so I have that under my belt. I love swimming, but for and 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 Cassidy, if you watch this or if you're if you're here joining us, for I uh, you had a lot of courage to talk to your people around something that is so close to you, um, and I just felt it was really important. And I hope that people who watched hers and listened to her and learned from her and watch and listen and learn from me and I'm going to learn hopefully from all of you is um, that you see some commonalities because I think there totally are some and uh, with that I guess I'll keep going. It's going to be this is the agenda kind of agenda for today. I want it to be as interactive as possible. I would really prefer to be in person with all of you just because um, I get to read the vibe and um, there's so much personality you can stop and pause and ask questions. For questions, you can throw them into the chat. And I didn't discuss this with Lee, but maybe he can keep tabs on that. And, uh, and then I, I am going to try and take pauses. I have planned throughout to take pauses to try and be a little bit interactive as much as that may be challenging virtually. Um, and then you can, we, there's t there'll be time at the end for Q&A. So my story, I think, will be weaving. I think I actually have planned this, so I think will be woven throughout the, the discussion this evening. And then we'll talk about what inclusion is, um, how, maybe discuss how we can be more inclusive. I'll talk specifically, there's so many. I, there's something here you'll see on the agenda, the tip of the iceberg. We won't capture it all. I'll be impossible in an hour and a half. Um, and so I've decided to focus in on inclusive language. Um, we'll talk again about why inclusion is important, maybe some ideas of where to start, and then totally some Q&A, and you can hit me. I'll throw it out there is I'm coming from the lived perspective of um, a woman with a physical 
congenital. That means I was born with my disability, so a physical disability. That'll be a lot of my stories. Because I'm a Paralympian, you're not going to hear about winning gold medals and how I got there. We can discuss that another time because I think there's awesome learnings for coaches about um, all of that. This is really about inclusion and, um, and trying to grapple and um, find some small wins around inclusion. So that's kind of the quote unquote agenda for today. So me in a nutshell, I don't know if you can see everybody's faces here, so I might shrink us up. Uh, me in a nutshell, or as we might say, uh, a slide. <laughs> and I thought I, it would be a fun way to introduce you with a few photos of my life and what I breathe. And you've already heard that I am an inclusion and diversity champion. It's probably because I live it and I was born this way. So here's little old me, stick person, kicking down boundaries and boxes and trying my best. I don't stir the pot for the sake of stirring the pot, but I have often, and this relates to accessibility, disability, inclusion, diversity, but it also relates to kind of processes. Um, when I was chef de mission, which this is a picture of me, that's the head of Team Canada in 2015. Um, who knew that many years of swimming back and forth following a black line on the swimming pool would lead me to a leadership role. But those are, I think many of us who are involved in swimming and coaches know that um, you get so many things like time management, leadership, many other skills out of swimming that I would be the head of Team Canada. But when I, when I say I'm knocked down barriers and boxes, like I challenge status quo, I don't really agree and live up to it's never been done before. So if we can keep that in our back pocket for the conversation, because the other thing about inclusion and diversity, and while I speak from the disability perspective, if we think about race and gender, sexual orientation, religion, socioeconomic status and reality, it's big and it's daunting. And I get that. It has been, my sole job has sometimes been in inclusion and diversity and you think where do we start we can't do it all but um we need to take steps so that's me blowing up the box i hope that today i'm circling around the light bulb is i give all of us and even myself light bulb moments hearing from you from maybe some of your perspectives um, to start the conversation there's a fun little pictures maybe shows how old I am. That's like 1980s, uh, early 1980s, late 1970s. That's my twin sister. And here's us again right now. And just this past year, um, my sister, I was born with my disability and my sister was, my twin was born without. And I say I am who I am today because of um, my twin, my parents for sure, and then Paralympic sport. And so Paralympic sport is represented here. This also shows how old I am from the 1980 photos of childhood to in my 13th career, four Paralympic games and a number of world championships and so many nationals and regionals and um, high school swimming and varsity swimming. But in the Paralympic year, the Paralympics, unlike the Olympics with their amazing Olympic rings that are recognized everywhere, changed their logos. <laughs> three times so I put those up there and I have this puppy tattooed on my back so I represent like when I pass on to the next realm wherever that is people will know I was a Paralympian in this certain age and demographic what else do I have here I'm a mama and um, when I was chatting before the presentation started we were my husband and I my husband up here and I were going to actually register my daughter for BC Summer Swimming this year because she's uh, just about to turn seven and we thought it would be super fun. Um, we did a lot of research and I did more research when I knew I'd come and chat to you this evening. And um, it fits with our lifestyle, busy lifestyle, and, and you make that really loud and clear on your website. But uh, we just thought it would be a great introduction and not overly competitive, which as people who are really knowledgeable about sport, we know you don't have to specialize early. So that's her. That's actually a picture of us. We did the Stuwamish Chief Hike Peak 2 just earlier this week. So we're a pretty active family. I put here the LGBTQ, LGBTQ, IS, Indigenous and Transgender flag, just to say that while I represent and speak to disability, I am broad-minded and I try and learn all of that. And because a lot of us here are swimming folks, 
This is the world I lived for a long time. Eat, sleep, swim, eat, sleep, swim. And it was A-OK -okay for me, but I love that BC summer swimming is about a whole lot more. And um, while I, I have that little kind of icon there or imagery, um, I think I am who I am today also because I managed to stay balanced in my swimming career. I'm a spokesperson and advocate. I get to be able to speak on behalf of Paralympians, but I wanted everybody here to know that there's also the Special Olympic Movement. Many of you might know about that because it's quite popular and well known. There's the Deaf Olympics where Deaf athletes can compete. Um, and then there's recreational sport and there's a whole lot of people um, with disabilities and there's a whole lot of people who are underrepresented in our communities who might not have opportunities in any of those because they either don't fit the bill, the disability classification, or they don't have the means to be able to participate in sport, whether it's money or knowledge that it exists. So when I talk about Paralympic sport, I always have to give awareness about all those other movements and to let people in the recreational and club systems know that there's a lot of people fall through the cracks who could benefit from everything that you do. And then globally, I'll talk about that. Um, I, I was born with my disability and I think when I was about three or four, I really started to pick up that people talked about me to my parents very differently than they did about my sister. And through that, I picked up that disability had a negative connotation. When I was three and four, did I know what connotation was? Nope. But I just knew that they talked about me differently. The tone was different, the types of questions they said, the things that they said. And so I, very early on, used to say, and it was like a record, and my sister used to say it too. I'm not disabled. The only thing I can't do is count to 10 on my fingers because I only have four. Um, and it kind of made people feel awkward. And when you're young, sometimes making people feel awkward feels good. But really, I just didn't want to associate with being disabled because there wasn't much I couldn't do. To be honest, there was. Still to this day, 13 years national team, all the swimming I did before that, all the swimming I still do now, I still can't put my own cap and goggles on. So there's things that I can't do, but none of them were and are life altering. So I just used to say that. And then, and later you'll find out how I was introduced to Paralympic sport. I found it about Paralympic sport and I saw a disability from a global perspective. And I realized that I'm fortunate to have been born in Canada and that I was born with my disability. I have teammates who acquired disability by accidents or illness like cancer. And that even they were, were lived in Canada. And I knew that I, if I, and then I saw athletes from Cambodia or other developing countries where the medical system isn't the same and where even society wasn't ready to welcome them in. I talked to one of the coaches from one of those countries, one of the Paralympic games I went to, and they said these people would be begging on the street if they hadn't found out about wheelchair basketball or swimming. And so that's when I came home and that is when I say I am who I am, my passion about um, inclusion, uh, diversity, health, wellness, physical activity, and sport is because of my twin. If she was climbing monkey bars, I had to climb them. My parents challenged doctors and people and teachers who said I couldn't. And then the Paralympic movement, when I saw that people who may not have a support system like my parents or my society um, couldn't advocate for themselves, I needed to come back. And so I identify as someone with a disability now. It's probably my top 10. Is it my first thing? Probably not, but it's up there. And then the old T-Rex does push-ups is I laugh at myself. I joke about myself all the time. I'm super serious. I take this stuff so seriously because I find it's really important. And while I said all that amazing stuff about being in Canada, we still have a long way to go. So that's me in a nutshell. And I hope it gives you a context or a picture of how I'm going to kind of try and guide through the conversation. Next up. Woo this looks busy. And so from a, I, I, when I do presentations, I, I would love for this to be closed caption for somebody who um, might be deaf and can't hear me, but that's just things that I drop into presentations to give people a little bit of awareness about. So this is a really busy, busy slide. It would not be ideal for someone with a visual impairment or maybe a processing or learning disability. But what the purpose of this is I did a Google search of benefits of physical activity 
for people or be benefits of physical activity. That's what I Googled. So there's about 20, maybe more um, titles up here of different articles and research articles. Um, the crummy part is only one out of all of them came up and actually was explicit that included disability. What's the problem with that? I don't know. For me, if you're not explicit, then people who are Indigenous of a different race, newcomers to Canada, someone with a disability, if we aren't being explicit about it in either the title or the meat of the article, um, whether it's on a social media news website or an academic website, then they don't see themselves there. And that's a big issue because I found out about Paralympic sport by mistake and it led me to who I am today. I'm healthy because of it. I'm confident because of it. I feel included in society for the most part because of swimming and sport and physical activity. And so there's benefits to sport, but not everybody sees themselves there until you have to specifically search for it. And then there's not very much either, which leads me to the BC Summer Swim Association. I got this right off the website and it's an amazing statement. BC, swim, BC um, Summer Swim Association is unmatched in its potential for fitness and fun. Amazing! Swimming is an activity whose benefits last a lifetime. So based on what I just said, and this is where I would love to look at all your faces if you're in the room together, is there something more that can be added? Is it for everyone, regardless of age, race, gender? And then, and then first of all, before you put that in there, is the organization and are the clubs ready to put that statement out there? But there's so many benefits and I love that that is what maintains this organization that I'm speaking to today because those benefits I totally believe in, but maybe there's people who don't see themselves joining because they maybe not see themselves there. So many people ask me in my life, like, who's your role model? And I think they assume it's going to be Terry Fox and he is amazing and he's up there. But my role model is actually Nelson Mandela. He or my, my hero and my role model is Nelson Mandela and maybe Silken Lauman. I didn't see people like me around the world and I found it about Paralympic swimming all by mistake. And it's still happening today in the year 2020. And my introduction to um, disability sport, para sport now is now called, was in the late 80s. So um, we still have a ways to go. Okay, I'm gonna take a break and I'll pop out to try and see more of your faces. This is a thought break, you don't need to share, but based on the introduction that I've given and where we've gotten so far and the benefits that BCSA um, says that they have, just a little self-reflection, I'll be quiet, zip so you can actually think. I'll be quiet for 30 seconds to a minute. And if you can think about the questions I have on the screen and, and in case people are having a hard time finding them or maybe can't read them. Again, I don't know if people have visual impairments or learning disabilities and processing things, but it's how inclusive is your club? How inclusive are you as an individual? Some of these might not be easy to answer or maybe be CSSA as an organization. And I'll be quiet and just self-reflect. If you have a notepad, or an iPad, however you take notes, an iPhone, cell phone. And you can think about more than disability, race, religion, gender, transgender, and think about how all of them might be combined. So there might be a person who's both a wheelchair user and indigenous. Think about that. Time check. Awesome. All right. That's a thought break. So my journey, I'll try and keep this brief. I'll shrink this up a little bit. I thought to help um, everybody hear and understand the different ways that inclusion can happen or where I'm coming from, I do a quick kind of <laughs> synopsis of my life and my journey with swimming. Initially, it was all physiotherapy. 
when you're born with a disability or if you acquire a disability, so that means through illness or an accident, you become disabled at any time in your life. And that could be someone with a stroke at older age. It could be someone who's had a car accident. It could be cancer. It could be all kinds of things. One of my teammates lost her eyes due to cancer. Um, she's actually living down in Victoria and doing triathlon now. And she was once a Paralympic swimming teammate of mine. Um, a lot of us end up um, in the swimming pool is because it's safe he, because you can't hurt yourself very well and you're usually supported by someone. So it was really physiotherapy and learning how to move and to get strong, um, especially a lot of those pools are warm and so it's easy for bodies. And, um, and then it was a safety and a life skill like many others and in North America, a lot of people are put into swimming lessons because it's a life skill, very different around the world and very, very different socioeconomically even in North America and Canada. Um, a story about the Sydney Paralympic Games, we adopted the one and only Jamaican swimmer. And um, an island nation does not have a lot of focus on swimming because of lack of pools, lack of facilities, and because of money. And we're like, you're, you're surrounded by water. And he said, yeah, you just don't have it. So my parents put me in swimming lessons. Um, it was whatever one was the colored badges. And um, my twin sister and I went through all of that. It was a life skill, it was safety, and I was hooked. Hence the pool rat. I became the annoying pool rat. Anytime I could get to the local community swimming pool or to a lake, I had the perma bathing suit tans that I'm sure a lot of you can understand because you're swimming peeps. But I was that kid who was in the pool and then when the lifeguards blew the whistle to get out for lunch or for the switch over or for whatever, I was like the last kid to try and jump off the diving board the last time. I just loved to, I took to the water so, so much. I grew up in northern, very rural Ontario, and a lot of little kids in Ontario, in northern Ontario, you did hockey if you're a boy. So here we talk about other inclusionary things. Hockey as a girl wasn't a big thing, and the girls did figure skating. And so we did figure skating in northern Ontario. Then we moved to Toronto, the big, big city in Ontario. And um, I, Figure skating was far too expensive for my family. It wasn't accessible in terms of geography or finances for my family. And so kind of by mistake, my parents were reading the local newspaper and read about um, a swim team that was for kids with disabilities and their siblings. And so they knew that we were pool rats and that we loved swimming. We were getting to the kind of upper part of our badges and our, our skills that it was gonna be start to be the lifeguarding stuff. And so they said, do you want to try out for the swim team? We both shrugged our shoulders and said, sure. We went to meet the coach and she was phenomenal. I'm still in touch with her today. She said, why don't you get in the water and show me what you can do? I dove in, did a few laps, stopped, was hanging off the edge of the pool. And she was like, you're pretty good. And I shrugged my shoulders because I don't know, I just loved it. And that's when she, I heard the word Paralympics for the first time. And she said, whether you pick our team or another team, maybe one day you could go to the Paralympics. Um, and I had never heard of the Paralympics. And I said, what is that? And then she said, well, just like the Olympics, they happen every four years, just like the Olympics, the best in the world compete, all the nations show up, many nations show up, just like the Olympics, there's, there's successes and there's failures, just like, and she, just like, just like, and I was like, oh, I'm in, I need to try this, I have to try this, I'd never heard about it, and then my sister, uh, we're sidekicks, and we're best of friends, and when I said, well, she was climbing monkey bars, I had to try, when I said I was all in on this, she thought she'd give it a go, she didn't last very long, um, this is where our twins, yin and yang, are separate. I have a pure competitive spirit, so much so I was like nine months pregnant and passing people without disabilities in the swimming pool here at Vancouver I'm, because I have this competitive spirit. But my sister, she loved to train, but she was throwing up her guts in, at a race time. So she didn't last very long, but that was my introduction to my first swim team. And I had an incredible coach who was a, an Olympian from a different country and he was amazing and helped me set really realistic goals. And I think that really led me to the long career I had because if you set unrealistic goals, you can burn out and not have fun. Um, before I made my first Paralympic Games, 
I was, I went to the same high school as my sister. It was the one where my feeder school, my elementary school went to, and I was allowed to compete um, on the swim team. And I think this is something that could be really great for BCSSA to think about and consider because I got to compete all the way up to the championships. I wasn't as fast as the people who qualified in the 200 IM, the 200 back, the 100 freestyle, my times, but they had devised a system where people with disabilities could go to the championships and win points for their school. And then it's like, the light switch flipped on and I became an elite athlete and I could no longer go to the regular high school and still compete on the world stage. So I went to a school that was a sports school and the rules there were it looked like you were stacking your teams. So I could no longer compete in high school sport. And so I had to take a break, but I just want everybody to think about that they devised this system where I could be with my teammates and win points for my team, even though I wasn't making the time standards and the splits for that. Then there's the Paralympic movement. In my nutshell intro, you heard about how it changed me. Um, I got to go to fair four Paralympic games and we'll leave that for another chat on the pool deck when my daughter is a part of swimming or at another time. But um, I can't pick one over another. They're all incredible experiences. And I had um, phenomenal coaches, both on the national team and in my my um my club and varsity program that led me there the varsity program uh, is what kind of kept me going and um specifically I'll, I'll give an example of of my varsity coach and my club coach who thought outside of the box like nobody's business um because of the nature of my hands um my elbows are fused that means they don't bend but they had me doing arm weights and tubing. And I had always focused beforehand on my core and my legs, which is the power of my swimming stroke. But all of a sudden I was lifting weights and figuring out how to do things. One of my coaches built me a push up bar. So when we were on deck, I could still be a part of the team. And it's just because if you think about, I have one finger and it's a little itsy bitsy bone. I can't do push ups on it. And even though they're probably shoulder shrugs, it's still swimming movements for how my body propelled me through the water. But he built a bar so that I could put my hand on and not have to put all my body weight on one hand. He had me do band <laughs> and pull for the first time in my life. By then I was a Paralympian. I'd been to two Paralympic games. I'd never done pull and he threw this band at me. And I was like, I'm gonna drown. I was a pool rat. It was in my blood. I don't think I could teach myself how to drown. And, but I was scared and he, he just challenged me and he wasn't scared to think outside of the box and really, really push me, whether it was when I broke my arm and he still had me show up to do core with my teammates and to be in that environment. But also after Sydney, where I won three gold medals and broke four world records, I did a little bit of traveling with my twin, my sidekick, because it was midterm and I didn't come, I didn't want to come back midterm. I needed to focus solely on my performance. But um, I came back and I was like, oh, I don't know, this is what I do. I'm in university, I'm gonna go swimming. So I went to swim practice, curled my toes over the edge after he told us what warm up was. And was my toes were curled over the edge of the pool and I could not will myself to get in the water and he um this is that human side of coaching that i i love and not every coach has it but i think every coach needs to search for it because he said i think you have faster swimming in you he's like are you running i was like i love running are you still doing core and weights loving it by the time you're at that level you're doing 11 or 12 practices a week maybe more just in the swimming pool plus other things and he said if you can come three days a week take your time and you find out if you have a love of swimming and that's where i got to for the first time not think about world records and qualifying time for national team i just focused on um the fun so probably like in bc summer swimming and summer swimming there's a whole spectrum of swimmers from beginners who are really working on their technique and might have a lot of work to go. And there's varsity swimmers um, within the province. Some schools are like only high performance. And so I made these fun goals of not of beating one or two heats 
of folks without disabilities and it was so fun and um, and it I think it helped motiv motivate me and stay in the system. When I retired from Paralympic sport, if I go down to the next bullet point, I coached. Um, I studied phys ed and kinesiology, so I got, uh, back in the time you got to get your NCCPA accreditation through your courses, so I, I don't worry, I wasn't just a Paralympian who, who coached, I was certified and train and um, I was like at 13 kids who loved to be there none of them were being forced to be there which was amazing and easy as a coach but uh, I don't know how as an athlete I was able to focus my butterflies in for me I got nervous for every single one of those athletes and I just bow down to all of you coaches who can do it I also thinking back and reflecting now I don't know if it was um, too close to my career to do it what I have done and what I'll still continue to do, I think until the day I have my last breath is if anybody calls me, and this happened when I moved to BC, one of my teammates knew I moved out here and there's a club who'd included a kid with a disability, which is a win. And um, I went and I talked to that kid, the swimmer with a disability, and I went and I talked to the coaches um, without disabilities who are trying to figure it out and navigate it all. And I think that's coaching in a whole lot of different ways. And I love that. And I think um, there were huge successes. I was able, when you're the only person who's different and Cassidy talked about this in her, in her, her chat last week with all of you, when you're the only one that's different, sometimes it's really hard to see where you fit, even though you all have a common love of swimming, let's say, because of who we are and what we're talking about today. And so I was able to talk to this athlete and say it was like when Michael Phelps was huge and, and like this incredible athlete and he still is, I'm sure. Um, and I was able to say, you know, my, when, when Michael Phelps' coaches tell him to do a tweak to his technique, it feels weird to him. So they're not picking on you. They're, they know their stuff around swimming and they're trying to help you. And I think that was really helpful for him to hear from someone with a disability because he was surrounded with people without disabilities. And then I was able to chit chat with the coaches and tell them and share some of my experiences. So um, I think that's where my, my coaching world is going to be. Um, and then doing these presentations and talking to people too. And then fit and fun for life. I'm lucky that I had a healthy and positive experience. There's a lot of folks, whether whatever sport they're in, especially if they go down that high performance route, they never high performance route, they never want to look at that pool or the rowing boat or a baseball or um, judoku again. So I'm really lucky. Okay, I'm talking a lot, but I'll do this. And I think right after this, we have a little interactive piece. So what is inclusion? And this is a diagram. I am giving kudos to Shelley Moore, who is kind of an academic and a researcher. If you follow her, she's got a blog. There's a hyperlink here that I hope you'll be able to reach. But if not, you can Google Shelley Moore. There's blogs, there's um, social media, just incredible tidbits and really approachable. It's not hard to absorb around inclusion and and hers is focused on um uh like the school system but i think it can relate to the sports system so i have examples of all of these for the swimming world that we're in i wrote them on my notebook so i'm just gonna look over here exclusion and so much of this is relatable to what um cassidy talked about last week as well um, exclusion is you're not invited to the table. It's not even an option. So it's directly or indirectly you're left out. The language that Cassidy used was covert or overt racism. So it, you can use that. And then another term we use, we use or we hear is soft inclusion. Um, I worked at Canucks Autism Network for three years as the manager of programs. And a lot of kids with autism don't qualify for special O don't qualify for Paralympic sport. And that's where the soft inclusion, I might call it hard exclusion because you can, if they hear stuff like, we don't think you're a fit for our program, um, but they're excluded, not welcome. Then there's segregation where you're set apart and you're different. If I think of a swim meet for exclusion, just not invited to the table, not even considered, it's not happening. Segregation, if you think of a swim meet, is there's two separate swim meets going on on two different days. And that's maybe what explains the segregation. Um, 
I'm really proud to come from Canada in the last two decades. Um, and I, I've been a part of the Paralympic system for more than two decades because I've been retired for almost two. Pardon? How is that possible? I can't believe I'm that old. <laughs> it was that long ago. No. Um, but the, the world stood up and took no, notice of the Paralympic movement. And between one Paralympic Games and the next Paralympic Games, it was like, I'll use, there's a lot of nations, but I'll use Ukraine. Ukraine had this dynamo team of, I'll, and I'll, I'll focus specifically in on their swimmers who are blind and visually impaired. And it was like, wait, they were nowhere to be found four years ago. Well, this is where I am proud to live in Canada because in the last two and three decades, kids with disabilities have been included in our school systems. Even when I went to school, I could have gone to a disabled only school, a segregated school, um, but I, and unless I was having a surgery and when you're born with a disability or acquire a disability, sometimes you have to have that because you need to try and get things done. And so every once in a while, if I had two arms and a, and a, a cast and a leg and a cast, then I went to the segregated school. But overall, you, you go to the school with your peers, whereas in the Ukraine and in a lot of countries still today in 2020, kids with disabilities are at separate schools. And so they literally go in China, Ukraine, and they're like, you, you're a swimmer, you, you, you. And so that's a segregated system. Um, I'm really proud that we include people with disabilities and you'll hear from me numerous times and already have, we have a long way to go in Canada. Um, but it's, I think, more inclusive than some of the other societies around the world. What segregation is not, if I bring it back to Cassidy's um presentation the residential schools were not segregation that's something completely different that's something up here where i would put all the light green dots in the big circle if i took this dot and just moved it up here that's assimilation that's you're not allowed to be you at all you have to be, be like everybody else and so i think that's important for me to point out uh, okay integration so if we think of a swim meet for integration, that's where there's a swim meet, but um, there's different events specifically for the kids or the folks with disabilities. Um, or maybe a lot of the Paralympic and Olympic trials, they were integrated for a long time. The Olympians swam first and the Paralympian events were at the end. They weren't even interspersed for a long time. So that's what integration is. Um, what are my notes? So if we think about integration a different way, if someone was deaf in one of your clubs, integration might be like, yeah, you can join the team, but you bring your own sign language interpreter. We're not gonna do that for you. Or someone who's blind, I don't know if any of you know this or many of you, all of you, if someone's completely blind, partially blind, there's a few different categories, they're called classifications, they can get a tapper. I'll bring my example of a pen but it's a big long stick where they tap them on the head. And this person is their training partner when they, and they should be there. So uh, in my opinion, an example, an integrated system would be like, yeah, you can come to our team, but you got to swim in the lane with all the other kids and you have to bring your own tapper. Oh, and we have a pool you need to have um, we're, we're going to be in the middle lane, so your tapper isn't going to be able to run back and forth. So you need to bring two people to come and tap on you. That's your responsibility, not ours. Um, what's another one? And the workout isn't, alter, uh, isn't altered. Um, I'm trying to think about if I talk about this later, but I guess I'll bring it up now so, and then I won't bring it up later. One of the examples where my coaches were able to think outside of the box was, let's say we're doing a set of 20 100s. If any non-swimmer catches this video online, they will not understand this, but I'm talking to swimming folks, so that's why I'll use this lingo. So let's say the set, the main set is 2100s on a certain pace. My coaches, uh, uh, all my coaches that I had, and I'm so fortunate to have had them, gave me 75s. They didn't let me do 100s where I would slowly fall farther and farther behind my teammates because I wasn't as fast as them. And then maybe physiologically and scientifically in swimming, I wouldn't get the warm down 
because I was still doing the main set. But also by doing 75s, I could keep with them in general and approximately the time, the same timing. Um, and then I also got to push off the wall and chat with them at the block at every other go. So that is an inclusionary practice because they adapted the workout to help me be included. And then this diagram is again for diversity. This is the gold standard. I think we're a long way away, but wouldn't it be so cool to find a world where everybody, regardless of who they are, disability, race, religion, can come as who they are and we have it all figured out. It, there's so much work to, to do. And I think if we take baby steps and we don't stop ignoring it, then um, we'll get there. Next, well, I got too far. Interactive break, yay, I get to hear from all of you. So whether you're on a computer or if you have a Wi-Fi enabled um, cell phone next to you, if you can go to www.menti.com and put in the code that I have here, I'll have you answer the questions I'll, I'm going to pull it up on my phone too and I'll add to it because we're a small group of people. One thing I want everybody to know is it's completely anonymous and I want everybody to be like as authentic as possible and what I'll do is um, I didn't know that Lee was on the board so I'll try and save the results and I'll share this with Penny and with Lee and then hopefully it can lead to further discussions down the way and right now we're not experts in this so this is just throw it out there and i've set it up where you can put two or three responses per and this is where it gets a little clunky i'm going to stop sharing my presentation and then we can look and as people respond please work uh, we can see the responses pop up on this screen all right so how about her i'll give us um a few minutes to do it so the question is what are some ways you as either a coach, parent, guardian, board member, um, or athlete can be more inclusive, or your club, or BCSSA. That's a mouthful when you say it fast. All right, here we go. And um, unmute yourselves and shout out if you're having problems. Oh, these are great. Wow, thank you. Thanks for thinking outside of disability too. Super. So I'll come back. I'll be able, hopefully. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna get back to the presentation. Oops, PowerPoint. Clunky, am I sharing screen yet? All right, share screen and Oof, I gotta figure that out. It's fun to be interactive. Okay, so we're back. Thanks for participating. So let's unpack that. I saw old facilities um, that only have male, female, and that is a huge challenge if we're trying to be open for people who don't identify as one or the other. I saw that there's no SWAD categories um, so there's a few different ways that we, me, why not, how did that happen? Sharing is paused. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, my computer's decided to do updates. That's the best thing that happens when I... Okay, back to the presentation. Sorry about that little side. Perfect. Okay, well, there's lots to talk about and we could deep dive all of those. I think I have one more, I know I have one more Mentimeter afterwards. So we'll keep going. I had to pick some out, not knowing what some of the responses were. And I'm gonna talk about language. So to preface language, to preface this, language is ever evolving. Um, and the example I give is in my, I'm 43, in my 43 years in this world, if I ex can go through all the terms that I've used for um, the population with which I identify as crippled, handicapped, disabled, special needs, disabled, person with a disability, and um, more recently, diverse abilities. So like, boom, that's, a lot and I want to say I'm only 43 and I've probably been tracking language for 25 or 30 years of all of that. So language is ever evolving and a lot of us may have seen that in where we are with our lives and with our peers and with wherever we work as well. Language is also cultural so that's really important for us to consider. Um, person first language is became really big here in North America and I'd say in the UK it didn't really catch on so it's cultural based on where you live and where you are for sure it's also an identity and it's really personal and to give you an example of that I um, there when I was at Canucks Autism Network and I know this from the blind and the deaf community is sometimes people identify um, uh, it's their identity. So I am deaf with a capital D. I am autistic with a capital A. It's not that I have autism. That's who I am and I'm proud of it. It's me. I'm not there yet as much as you've learned that I, um, I'm proud of my disability based on where I started, where I did not identify as having a disability, but it is, um, for me, if society can't see me as a contributing member of society, then I need to be seen as a person first. So when I walk down the street and there's a stranger and I, it surprises everybody, including my CEO, where I work most recently, um, that this happens to me pretty much on the daily in the year 2020. Uh, my, my disability is quite different and it's very visible. But um, people, they see the disability first and they don't see me as a mom, as an employee, as an advocate, as a contributing member of society. And um, for me, I choose to use the language person or swimmer with a disability versus um, disabled. So I just wanted to give that background. There's no right or wrong. Like I said, I think in the example, it's ever evolving and a lot of peoples and populations you might see in here are really trying to sometimes take power back in the world where society has pushed them off to the edges that's what marginalized means by using some of the, those words back and taking power over them so i'll go to the next slide and this is where i i stretch away from um the disability aspect and I get a little bit broader again. I just want to premise that I'm going to throw up, I don't know, 15 terms that I've heard in the last, I've been working in the sports system pretty much my whole working career and more recently a lot around inclusion and disability. And I've heard these at conferences, um, by the water cooler at conferences, etc. cetera, um, and in my day-to-day -day life, um, in meetings, um, if you use these terms, you're not a bad person. These have been handed down to us by generation and generation. We see them in movies, it's something called socialized. You're not a bad person. And Cassidy says that too uh, last week when she was talking about racism in swimming. It doesn't mean you're bad, but I think once someone puts the mirror up or brings it forward, then we all really should, if we want to be inclusive, take note and make steps to change. So um, you're not a bad person if you've said these or say these. 
Um, some of them are going to be really hard for me to say, and I'll probably make faces when I say them, but I'm going to go for it. So here we go. That's so gay. Chairman. That's retarded. Manning the registration table. That's lame. The evaluation raped me. Sportsman. That's so crazy. That's so ghetto. You guys. That gypped me. No homo. Let's have a quick powwow. The rule of thumb. He looks like a terrorist. Sitting is the new smoking. Didn't you know? Team X crippled their opponents. Old timer sport. And I think that's the end of it. I know it. I keep saying I think. I planned this thing. I know it. So that's the end of it. So some of these, and we could do, and I have run hour and a half sessions just on language where we would have big pieces of paper out and we would try and think of what's a different way that you could say a lot of these things when someone's saying that what what's the meaning behind it but um i i thought i'd bring these up and again i don't have the time to break down every single one but some of them relate to different people who are um, underrepresented, whether it's gender, disability, socioeconomic, um, sexuality. And so there are things that maybe we can take out of sport. And that's why I decided to start with language, because um, this is where I want to chat with everybody, um, because I feel like language is probably one of the more tangible things that we can adopt. So this is if you want to take yourselves off of mute or you're not, I know we're not a big group of people this evening, but you can take yourself off mute or add in the chat if you have any other examples. I know I did this session with a group of sport leaders from provincial sport organizations and a lot of people either with lived experience or other ones had things that they had heard too and wanted to bring in or if there's anything you want to share about some of these, we can have a little discussion so it's less of Elizabeth and more of all of us. So I'll just wait for a couple of minutes if anything has anything to contribute. If not, I'll keep going. I think I'm a little curious myself um, on the lame one. And I, I wonder if I could get a little more explanation on that. Yeah, so lame used to be before crippled. Um, lame used to be a term for to kind of identify people with disabilities. So you were lame. Um, I think it might be in uh what's the christmas story with the three ghosts and the the there's been a remake dickens i think the dickens novel they talk about that little guy with the crutch being lame and so if you say that's so lame and i know people don't intend it anymore for the most part they don't intend to say the connotation is around disability, but it's kind of a slight on disability. That's so lame. It's like the same as that's crazy. People have real mental health challenges. And by saying that's crazy, it diminishes and takes away from people who really have mental health issues. So instead of saying that's crazy, it's that's really out there. That's unbelievable. I'm not sure about that. And same with that's lame would be like, um, what could be a different one that you could use as lame is, I don't know, that's not, that's not on. That's not on the up and up. So lame has a connotation of disability. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, one woman who is Indigenous said that she hears, and this is maybe because of her lived experience, she hears squaw a lot. And I hadn't, I was like, whoa, that's to me seems so old school. But a lot of these terms seem pretty old school. Yeah, so there's, um, and then some like chairman, a lot of people are now moving towards chairperson to be a bit more inclusive, et cetera. With sportsmen, um, sportsmanship is a term that is often thrown out of sports, right? Yeah. So what do, what do you, what do we do? What do you do about, you know? How do you... <laughs> and that's where, yeah, that one, I don't know, a great athlete, um, great, some of them, they might just, 
need to stick around that's one that i kind of try to contend with so um oh, what what could be um not sportsman um great team player right great athlete i know it doesn't have the same historical connotation but i was working with one sport recently oh the ball boys and bat girls and right that's a historical term. It's up to them to figure out if they can or want to change it, but knowing that it could possibly um, be off-putting. And that's something I forgot to say in the first slide is there's a lot of people, and I might be um, one of them who's included. I teach spin class and I have folks from every walk of life who come to my spin class. And I have heard gay couples say, oh, people are so sensitive about this. So. There's people with lived experiences who might not be offended. But what I, I like to bring it back and my, my former colleague and I who have done the inclusive language workshops is what if it turns one person off? What if one person comes and hears a term and you've lost them forever? Or you, or you built the organization and the club and the coaches did so much right to get them there and you have representation and the inclusion is dialed and then one term is dropped and you lose all of that. So I think that's where this inclusive language, it's more than political correctness. Political correctness is kind of externally forced upon you. Inclusive language is like, what's the ultimate goal here? Do we want people to feel like they're included? And can we make steps to do that? And when I worked at Canucks Autism Network, we, we did a lunch and learn with um, inclusive language. And maybe this is something you, your clubs, your peers, um, if you take it outside of your work, you could do this. And we made an environment where we, we decided we would try and take hey guys and hey crazy out of our vocabulary, whether it was emails to one another in the chat room at lunchtime or in meetings. But we made it and we agreed that we would make it a safe environment where we would try not to say those. And if we did, it would be like, oh, hey, hey, we're, we're, we're trying not to do that. Because again, we've grown up in a certain world and have been saying certain things. So that's, I wanna do a time check. Yeah, we're good. Um, so I thought that that would start with inclusive language. All right, next up. Oh, other inclusive um, practices. I put a, uh, an iceberg here because we can't cover it all in one night. It's um, inclusive language is kind of the tip of the iceberg and there's so much down. I thought I'd put a few examples from what I've seen um, as an advocate and a champion for inclusive sport as a Paralympian and in the work I've done when I worked with FIA Sport British Columbia, I evaluated, I was on the evaluation team to evaluate 62 provincial sport organizations and um, when I, when I was evaluating them on inclusion, and there was a panel of three other panelists who were including them on their coaching, um, their governance, and their high performance, and I was doing inclusion. I got to ask, I started the conversation off with, often with, so how inclusive are you for folks with disabilities? And they'd say, or people, of, and I'd list down, a lot of people are underrepresented by gender, race, socioeconomic, et cetera. Um, and they say, our doors are open. And I'm not sure if I said that at the beginning. Are your doors open, but do they see themselves there? And so I got to have these conversations with a lot of support organizations. And so I'll, some of the examples I'll bring up now are from that experience working um, with support organizations. And it was around more than, more than disability, but a lot of these will be around disability. So there's the built environment, that physical environment, the go-to that people think about and it's, um, I have a bee in my bonnet about it, yet it's so important for people who require them, is I think the default when people think about disability, I use the example of when I'm, if I stand out on a busy street in any of the cities or towns where you live, or maybe I send someone else out because I have a disability, so that could be awkward. Um, but I say like, what's the first thing you think of if I say disabled or handicapped? And I still think it would be largely negative, or I think people might say wheelchair user uh, or ramps or curb cuts. And that's the built environment. But to help you think of the built environment more at a, our swimming pools, that's a ramp into the swimming pool. It's a lift into the swimming pool. 
its um, change rooms in the built environment, as someone mentioned on our Mentimeter, that um, are open to more, that, that are more inclusive um, for the gender binary. Um, so people who don't identify as male or female, um, or for people maybe with disabilities who might require support, they might not want to get changed and have someone helping them in an open change room. They might want a private space. And if an old, old facility, when I worked at Curl BC, a lot of facilities were really old. Curling was huge in the 40s and 50s, and they weren't thinking about wheelchair accessible and wheelchair curling that was going to be introduced decades later. And so that's the, the built environment. And it's, I mean, there's a whole world. Now there's something called the universal design, which is um, if it's good for everybody in the world, then it's good for everybody in the world. Like instead of doors into washrooms, if you go to some of the newer buildings, a lot of universities have these, a lot of big new conference centers, is that there's a winding hallway to go in and you don't even have to open a door to get there. That is universal design because someone who uses a wheelchair, a walker, crutches, or a, a parent with a stroller um, can get in without anything. A people power. This is when I talked about a sign language interpreter. If you have a swimmer who's deaf. So at the, at the opening ceremonies of an event, if you have a coach who's deaf, um, and that's possible. When I worked at Curl BC, we had the athlete wasn't deaf, but the dad was deaf. And we needed to bring in sign language interpreters to the coaches meetings. So thinking about people power. Three years I worked at Canucks Autism Network. A lot of our kids, youth and adults needed the support of a person um, to support them. And that's people power. So maybe it's volunteers, maybe it's having a budget line for a lot of these things or for the athlete who's blind someone to come or two people to come and tap them at practices and at competitions. That's what I say about people power. Um, communication, your websites. I don't know if you have flyers and stuff. Are they representative of a diverse group? Is it really clear that you actually, like a lot of the provincial sport organizations are open to everybody? And then there's the policies and systems and that's like, oh, so daunting and overwhelming, but if you scratch away at them one by one and you research people, best practices that other people have done, you can steal and work away. I truly believe that if it's a part of the agenda at an AGM and at coaches conferences, every single time you meet, and it might be in one specific area of inclusion and diversity, and you tackle it, and then you keep that one going and then you bring on another one, then that's a way that you can do it. It is big and it's daunting and it, it will not happen overnight, um, especially with so many volunteer led boards and stuff. There's attitudes for me, that's the biggest one. I don't think any of these changes will happen if there's not a will and the attitude to want to do that. So if we think back to BCSSA being fit and fun, um, and the benefits are for everybody and for busy families. Is it actually for everybody? And do the leaders and the people in charge and the faces of your organization, as well as the athletes, do they really want to be more inclusive? It's all about attitude and how you approach things. I think Cassidy talked about intent. And intent is a tricky one because you can have good intentions and then it's not enough. Um, and I think it comes through with um, how it's presented. So you have to be careful with, well, we intended it to be this way. As soon as you learn maybe that it, it wasn't taken that way or didn't come across, there's a responsibility on the team, whatever the process is or the statement to really look back at what that is. And I say a whole lot more because there is a huge long list of practices you can do from changing um, the, makeup of a swim meet, um, how you categorize people in the system, um, all kinds of things. Let me see what's next. I think it's another Mentimeter. I wanna leave time for Q&A, looking good. Oh, wait, did I pass? Oh, where's the Mentimeter? Okay, so back to why it's important. I'm kind of repeating myself, really. At least here in Canada, 
um, sport, physical activity, and being a part of your community is a human right. Um, it's important for everyone, and you have it in your own statement of your organization. You know that it's a benefit, so try and make it a benefit to everyone in your community or society. It's also really okay and really important to know what you know, and also with number four there, to know what you don't know. I, um, I'm a facilitator for inclusion training through Via Sport British Columbia, and it's called All Youth Matter. I highly recommend it. And we really dive into this, like you know what you know and you don't know. And it's an amazing, amazing training, but I'm not here to push that, but we talk a lot about that. And even me, who's super passionate about this, I still have so much more to learn and I still make mistakes and that's okay. And then as I did in the first mentee meter, you can do a self audit like, wow, Elizabeth has just talked and talked about she used her pronouns when she when she introduced herself. She didn't explain that. Maybe I should look up what that is. Do a little self audit about or there was that list of the terms and I was too shy to ask her about it. So maybe I should look up who that might impact and how that might be deemed non-inclusive language. So you can do a self audit. Where am I more comfortable putting my arm out and saying I might like to lead something? So you can self audit. And I might, might have probably should have put there audit your organization or your club too. And you have to start somewhere. I think it's a repeat of number eight, to be honest. But if you talk about it, like I just said, if it's a part of the conversation, you've done this incredible opportunity of bringing Cassidy to talk about racism, me to talk about disability and inclusion. So now you need to keep the conversation going. And then number eight, what well, number six is start somewhere, talk about it, number seven, and then take actions. And um, baby steps are better than no steps. So we're back to Mentimeter. Just rem a reminder that it's anonymous. There's a neat sliding scale for you to do. And I, there's four statements um, to respond to. So the code is back up there in case you got kicked out. And it should be, do you see the next question now? The sliding scales? Um, I might need to get out, stop sharing, oops. And go to next one. All right, use the sliding scale to answer the following statements. Number one is, and you can skip them if you feel uncomfortable, it is all anonymous. But I know or I have ideas. And I think that's what on the left hand side of the scale is not yet. On the right hand scale is yes, I have some ideas. So you're not an expert. You might not have all the answers, but somewhere on the sliding scale. Could you, could you get the code back up on the screen? Oh yeah, the code is 2042431. So 2042431. And I can save these results and share them with Lee and Penny. But that's pretty, that's pretty cool that people are starting and you may have come on, you might have signed on to this. We find often that when people um, join into these types of conversations, they already have either someone close to them who might be experienced with this or in a different world in their lives. So if we had a bigger group of people, it might look differently, but you can see these moving around. It's really, really interesting. Great. So I'll share these with um, Lee and Penny. And then I have to reshare my screen to wrap it up and go to questions. PowerPoint. Perfect. Okay. So without being able to give you all the answers to everything inclusion and diversity oriented, haha, <laughs> I hope I have given you an idea, of course, and I think most of you probably know how big that is. Maybe there's some ideas to start and it's pretty cool because Cassidy did this too. She, it was really serious stuff. And when, when I, sharing the challenges that she had 
and I have, I've had challenges too, um, was super important. But when she shared that she almost walked away and sometimes want to walk away and that putting that presentation together. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, cause you missed Cassidy's presentations on racism and swimming, you really should watch it. And it'll probably connect a little bit is we both don't want to leave you with how hard it's going to be. Cassidy gave you some ideas of where you can start in terms of addressing racism in swimming. And I wanted to, leave you with some of those too so a little bit like-minded there so ideas of where to start if you think about what i can do today i we can do today or what i what can i and we do tomorrow here's a list and a lot of them are related to communication and language because building out a whole new change room in an old facility might take a lot of fundraising dollars and you might not be the owner of the swimming pool but some of these might be a little bit more tangible, especially for the what I can do today. And then you can address lifts into swimming pools and um, non-gender change rooms um, in a larger conversation as much as it could be, it should be important right now. We need to get it done. So there's registration forms. A lot of registration forms don't ask if you have a disability or, um, uh, they only put male or female as the options for gender. And so the recommendation there is to leave it blank for gender. And then someone doesn't feel forced to put themselves in the block. And then I don't have the answers. And this conversation came up a lot with PSOs, provincial sport organizations, when I was evaluating them is the government asks us how many males and females we have. So there's, this is the systems issue is the whole province and country isn't there yet. But from an inclusive practice, you could ask, and then if you needed to put them in a men's or women or girls or boys heat or final, you could say, have language with, if you had to choose one in order to compete right now with where our sport is, which one would you identify? But you could, if you had the open box for what their preference is, that means when you're talking to them, you can use the pronoun that they prefer. That's one example. And then I talked about websites and communications. Audit your websites. Is there a language? I was going through something with somebody um, and they were talking, it was a, a scenario and they talked about, tell me about a time when you worked with a manager and you didn't agree what was his? And I was like, whoa, the default is that a manager is male. Whereas really you could say, what would their response have been? So you can maybe audit there and then think about larger than gender. Is, do you have disability? Um, again, it's, it's not easy, but that's somewhere to start. Introductions at meetings. So I introduce myself and I use my pronouns. The evidence there is it seems small and insignificant. It also seems weird if you're not used to doing it, but if you do it, I can tell. And at Canucks Autism Network, we started network. We started to do this at all of our programs. Um, and for someone who doesn't identify as male or female, or who might be misgendered, so it might not look like what society. It means a great big deal. And I've been fiddling with a pin that I have that maybe is something we, at our, our events, we started to have stickers, but I'll try and hold it up to the camera. I can't see, I hope it shows, but there's pins and it says, hi, my pronouns are, and this says she, her, hers. But you can have, if you're at a conference or a swim meet, or maybe you have a name badge, you can add a pronoun and people, if they're not comfortable, can leave it blank, but if they are comfortable, they can. And then there's he, him, they, there. And then I've been at conferences where they have blank ones and you can write in your own. Because some people prefer to say she, him, they. Um, so that could be something that you could do. Bring in experts to talk to you. And you did that with um, Cassidy last week. That's phenomenal. And at your different conferences, you can do that. Maybe you can take 15 minutes out of a swim practice one day and have someone on your swim team talk about it. What's really important, and this has happened to me many, many times in my life, 
is that everybody turns to me when something it needs to be said around disability. Like, oh, there's a workshop on disability. Hey, Elizabeth, you want to go? And I was like, wait, uh, I already live it and I know it. It's up to you too. So you got to really be careful about tokenism. So not everybody, now that Cassidy's put her hand up and she's um, disclosed that she's passionate and knowledgeable, as an organization, you can't focus only on Cassidy to be the one spokesperson that's heavy and daunting on her. And I think she expressed that and that would be the same for others. Lead by example. So if you're gonna try and change language, try and change it yourself. This is the know what you know, what know what you don't know. So you might have to reteach yourself. I don't know, has anybody heard of a living library? That could be a cool thing where you bring people in with different experiences and you check them out like and you instead of checking out a book you have a, a sit down conversation and you um, ask them questions when you ask people questions the one thing i used to go and lecture to medical schools like nursing schools and occupational therapy schools and the one thing people i get uh, people come up to me at random all the time public transit at the swimming pool a lady stopped me at the swimming pool two weeks ago and i was like Ugh. What's she gonna say? She's like, can I ask you something? And often it's about my disability and it's just kind of not, but she actually wanted to ask me about my mirrored goggles. It was so enlightening. She had clear goggles and normally swam inside. So that was really enlightening. But if you're gonna ask somebody um, something, you might say, hey, I'm a swim coach or my club is trying to be more inclusive. I would love to learn from you. And that's a whole lot da less daunting than something. Cause sometimes when you're under your, um, different in the world, you get questions from left field that can, left field that can really hit you um, um, off guard. And I think Cassidy used the term as it can be quite triggering. So just come from a really authentic place and tell where you're coming from when you ask the questions. And I'd say 90 plus percent of the time you'll get a positive response. And then agree to set a safe environment to have those conversations. All right, I'm flying through. We have seven minutes to go. We're at the end. So I want to say thanks for having me. I really wish we could have been there in person so I could read the body language and stop and talk. And, and we can't do that virtually. I feel like I've been talking my mouth off. That's not usually my MO. Um, I'll open it up to Q&A and I put feedback welcome in case time runs out. But I don't know if um, if Penny or the organization sends out questions afterwards, but I truly want to know what I could have done better if it was what you expected or not. So if you can pass that along to the folks in charge and then let me know, I always want to get better um, to make it resonate with the audiences um, that come. So questions or feedback. And I'll stop sharing the screen. No one else has any. I have, I have a question. Uh, you talked about uh, your experience in high school a little bit and how you were integrated more into the swing world with that high school program. Um, seeing as currently, uh, I, I originally swam and grew up in Alberta summer swimming, and we had full classification for para swimmers. We went to BCS to say we don't. Okay. Um, wow. And so we don't say no, but we also don't give them a space to compete in what would be deemed on a global scale as the acceptable realm of competition for them. You know, okay. 14. So what would be a good stepping point into that direction? Or if classification is not a good way to go because you've experienced it all, like what is the right way for oh. it to occur? Ooh, that's a doozy. Yeah, that is um, like classification in and of itself is something that, um, you have to contend with. If you want to pursue um, Paralympic sport, you need to be classified in order to qualify and know where you rank. And so I, I would say for anybody with a disability, if they want to compete, the classification system can happen at the regional level and doesn't have to be as intimidating. And it intimidating might not be the right word, but if if, how the organization presents it in their policies or registration packages is we want to include you we would love for you to win points for your teams or to gain points for your teams um, in order to do that we have a classification system it mimics 
the SwinBC system, and then you can um, be a part of the team, that would help. I don't know in terms of how closely you'd have to work with SwinBC in order to get that, but I think that that would be the value. And then there's the aspect of those who don't, so someone who's deaf may not have the same challenges and probably could be the same speed um, as long as there's a bright light or a flag that's dropped for them to know that the gun goes off. Um, that would be something to consider. I don't know if you have anybody who's deaf that's already swimming in the system for you. Um, Good question here. I know we had one in my old pub. Mm -hmm. so, it was a uh, look at the light for the yeah. start. Type yeah. Thing. And that happens. Uh, that's how they would do it at the deaf, deaf Olympics too, um, whether it's track and field or for swimming. So back to the para sport and the physical disability or functional disability, I might look to provinces like Ontario, the OFSA, this, um, and look at what their system is and try and bring it into here to here because it seems like the most equitable way to do it. And I would not ask you to invent your own classification system because it, it, it's, first of all, it's political <laughs> and you don't want to be a part of that. So also, if someone falls in love with sport, if I think about my husband who doesn't have a disability, he was a multi-sport athlete. He went to university to play volleyball. Between getting recruited to play volleyball and university starting, a new athletic director came in, swiped out the volleyball program, wasn't pleased with it. My women's team captain, I'm one year older than my husband, was walking through the hallway and recognized him was like, Ian? And he's 6'3 then, but he was a summer swimmer when he was 15. And she was like, holy, she's like, are you going to swim? And he's like, swimming, speedos, mornings, no. But he needed sport in his life, right? And so who knows if you have a classification system and they don't need to go and travel to Italy to get classified. You can do it locally, um, probably with the help of Swim BC or Swimming Canada. But if they fall in love with swimming, who knows what types of doors that may open up to them and then they're in the system. So that would be equitable and for me would make the most sense. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm, you know where to find me now so I can be a sounding board in the future. Great. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for giving me an hour and a half of your evenings, everybody. I don't know what your days are filled up with. And I really hope this was meaningful and more questions. We have two minutes, but we don't have to take it to the dead end either. <laughs> I don't have a question at this time, but I did want to say thank you so much for, for making yourself available to us. It was a very um, thought provoking and enlightening and just to kind of, you know, I myself live with a disability. Mine is invisible. So I face a, a different set of challenges than someone whose disability yeah. is visible. Yeah. Um, so I relate to a lot of, or parts of what you said anyway and uh um you know as somebody who's working on a board of one of the clubs you know i have a huge vision to to make sport more accessible um for our club and so thank you for kind of um kind of lighting the fire under my butt again to, to keep that <laughs> to, to keep that fight going thank you Oh, thanks for sharing. And I don't think I brought up invisible disability and I normally do. So thank you. And it, um, the, I, I had it on my notes. Oh, I have like four statements that I didn't want to miss out on. And that's one of them. You can't see all diverse or all disability and all diversity. You can't know what people's religions are or that some disabilities are invisible. And even when I joined the Paralympic movement, there's a classification of people who are um, visually impaired. And you walk down and you're like, what's there? I don't get, but you, that's a dangerous, you can't make assumptions about people, whether it's race, gender, sexuality, or disability. So thanks for bringing um, that up, Kate. And thanks for sharing. That's it, that's the end. We're out. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, from all of us here. I know I enjoyed it and I, hopefully everyone else did as well. Um, we'll be in touch and if everyone wants to unmute and say farewell. <laughs> do it that way and they'll go by and Elizabeth let's hang on and I'm gonna chat for a bit after. Okay, okay. So like a, a Thanks everybody. Small but mighty group. <laughs> bye. Bye. Cool. Thanks. Bye bye. See you Carl. Bye Carl. See ya.